Now I'd like to introduce the co-founder of FSG and the Shared Value Initiative, Mark Kramer. In addition to being a senior advisor to the SVI, Mark is a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School where he teaches shared value to MBA students and leads the executive education course on purpose and profit. Mark, the stage is yours. It's a real pleasure to be here today and to have the opportunity to celebrate the 10 year anniversary of creating shared value. Actually 10 years almost to the day since the article came out in November. Uh, and to be able to celebrate it with Bobby and Alicia and Georgina and Kim, who've been so helpful in sustaining and spreading this thinking, uh, to be able to celebrate it with our partners in Australia and Hong Kong and Africa and India, who have helped spread this thinking around the world, and to be able to share it with all of you. I think the largest single audience we have had from around the world for any of our shared value summits over the last 10 years. So thank you for being with us. You know, I have to say these 10 years sometimes feel like they have gone by very, very quickly. And other days, they feel like it's been a very long 10 years. I have to say I've learned a lot over the years. And for me, the journey that I've been on these 10 years has been somewhat unexpected. Because for me, the journey really started 10 years before that, when I began working with Michael Porter on strategic philanthropy and how to think about the way in which philanthropy can create greater impact by having a deeper understanding of strategy. And that's why we started FSG originally as Foundation Strategy Group, because the idea was to work with foundations to help them be more effective. But as we began to work with foundations and then later with companies, we began to see that companies have so much more impact on our world and on our lives than charities and foundations do. After all, when you think about the 100 largest economic entities in the world, more than two thirds of them are companies rather than countries. And if we think about our daily lives, we spend more and more of our lives impacted by what is happening uh, in our relationships with companies than by what is happening in our relationships with charities or foundations or even government. Now, that's not to say that philanthropy is unimportant or that governments are unimportant. They are both essential and we cannot solve social problems without them. But philanthropy often works in a very fragmented way, picking out individual charities or organizations to help. And they can do a lot of good, but they can rarely solve the systemic problems that we face as a country and as a planet. And government, while it is essential to solving social problems, nonetheless is um, frankly broken if we think about it today. In most of the world, it is not doing what is necessary to help our average citizens have good lives, to live comfortably, and to live in a world that is sustainable. So like it or not, I have come to believe that it is up to countries, uh, to, excuse me, to companies, to have the kind of impact we need to create a fair, equitable, and sustainable world. Now, that's not easy. But I have to say, I have become quite hopeful in some ways in these last 10 years, because there is no question that the world is moving in a shared value direction. Different people and different organizations use different terms. Some might talk about inclusive capitalism. Some might talk about stakeholder capitalism. Others might refer to B Corps or mutual benefit or, or corporate purpose. But behind all of these different terms is the same idea that companies cannot separate their economic success from the well being of their stakeholders and the society and planet on which they operate. And we have seen more and more examples of companies getting this message and embracing this idea. You know, when we wrote the article 10 years ago, 
Michael Porter and I said, the greatest economic opportunities that we face today are solving the world's problems. Well, it's interesting, 10 years ago when that article came out, Exxon was the world's most valuable company. And Tesla was a struggling recent IPO at $17 a share. Well, today, of course, Tesla is almost 20 times more valuable than Exxon. And that prediction that seemed a bit outlandish at the time, that the way to make the most money was to help solve the world's problems has certainly proved true for Elon Musk. And for many other social entrepreneurs who have developed new countries, new enterprises that have disrupted traditional industries. And I have to say, as I look industry by industry at insurance, companies like Discovery that have found ways to become more profitable by making their customers healthier. And renewable energy, companies like Enel that are generating greater profit from renewable energy than from fossil fuels today. FinTech companies that have exploded around the world giving access to financial services and savings and loans and banking to millions of people who had no access to financial services before. Even food and beverage companies that are finding that plant-based meats and healthier foods and drinks are much more popular. And when I think about the different issues that companies touch on, it's been a real learning curve for me over these last 10 years as to how many different issues that I never would have imagined are actually shared value issues turn out to be. And one of the best examples is what Bobby was just talking about in terms of the importance of racial equity. You know, just to pick one example, McKinsey did a study recently that Hollywood has missed $10 billion a year in revenue because the industry has been run by white men who have not appreciated the stories of people of color or of women. And they have missed making the films that would have attracted those audiences in huge numbers. When I think about employees and the challenges companies have recruiting employees and the importance of employee engagement and morale, there's no question that companies that have a true commitment to a social purpose that really embrace shared value are finding it easier to recruit employees and are finding greater employee engagement. When I think about how companies report their results, more and more companies are using integrated financial reports that are bringing the social and environmental impact together with their financial performance. And they're talking about their social and environmental impact on the quarterly earnings calls to investors, not just to NGOs and not just in press releases. And when you talk about investors, there's been a massive shift too. In the US, 25% of all new money that went into mutual funds last year went into ESG funds. That's $51 billion. And there are now four times as many ESG funds as there were a decade ago. So there's a lot to be optimistic about in terms of the change companies are making. And I'll have to say, I've learned a lot over these 10 years as well. I've learned that most companies are operating on business models that were developed decades, in some cases like banking or life insurance, centuries ago. The business models were developed when we didn't know about climate change. We didn't know about social determinants of health. We didn't even know that smoking was bad for you. And yet science and scientific knowledge has advanced. We now know a great deal more about the impact that companies are having on our planet and our people. And so companies face a choice. They need to figure out how to shift their business model to take into account what we know today. And far too many companies are instead choosing to ignore what we know today in the hope that they can keep their existing business model for just a few more quarters to earn those profits 
without having to make radical changes. I've come to see that there are really three types of shared value companies. There are companies that are born with a shared value mission like Tesla. There are companies that are doing good in the world like pharmaceutical companies. But until they become explicitly focused on reaching populations that they're not serving today, rural villages in India, low-income populations in the United States, being sure that they are developing drugs that meet the needs not just of affluent white customers, but of lower income customers and people of color. They can transition to a more shared value business model. And then there are companies where given what we know today, their basic business model is harmful. And that's certainly fossil fuel companies, that is some of the food and beverage companies that are driving sugary drinks and so on. And those companies need a fundamental transformation if they're going to become shared value companies. And that is very, very hard to do. And frankly, it is not happening nearly fast enough. And so for all that the world has moved towards shared value, has embraced the social purpose of business, it is nowhere near enough. If we look at what is happening at COP26, even as we speak, if we think about all that money going into ESG funds, but we really don't know what ESG funds are or do, ESG measurement itself is so deeply flawed and inconsistent. And I teach a course to MBAs at Harvard Business School on purpose and profit and shared value. But I find that students come into my class still assuming that maximizing shareholder value at all costs is the goal of business, that social initiatives, that the social impact of business is fundamentally about public relations, not about strategy. And I continue to see companies that are merely making remedial changes around the periphery of their operations, rather than rethinking their business model in a way to drive competitive advantage through positive social impact. We have a session tomorrow that I hope you will join me for, where Paulina Murphy from the World Benchmarking Alliance will tell us about their detailed and extensive study of 2,000 companies around the world in different industries to track their progress toward the sustainable development goals. I don't want to steal Paulina's thunder, but I will tell you the answer is we are nowhere near on track. In industry after industry, 2%, 5%, maybe 10% of the world's leading companies are actually on track to meet their goals. For all that we have made improvements in how we measure the social impact of companies, and there have been wonderful improvements, those measurements are still divorced from the business plans and the profit drivers that the companies are focused on. And because the way we measure social impact is separate from the way that we measure business success and profitability, Unfortunately, there are all too many companies out there that have made commitments to sustainable goals and have put forward business plans for growth and profitability, but the two are completely incompatible with each other. And because the measurement systems are not linked, companies can continue to do that. So for all the optimism, I have to say, I am also deeply frustrated and discouraged. We cannot continue for another 10 years on the slow and tentative path towards shared value that the world's leading companies have been on this last decade. Now, I mentioned Tesla's tremendous success earlier, and it's really quite remarkable not just the success of Tesla, 
but the impact that Tesla has had on the entire automobile industry. Tesla was started about 18 years ago when the idea of electric cars was just utter nonsense. Today, every major car company in the world has committed to moving to all electric cars over the next five to 10 years. So from the start of Tesla 18 years ago to somewhere between 2025 and 2030, a total of about 30 years, we have shifted the global automobile industry to a fundamentally new business model, changing everything about their production and operations in a way that is one important step toward a sustainable planet. 30 years may seem like a long time, but to change an entire global industry, it's actually pretty remarkable. The problem is every industry needs to go through equivalent degree of change. The business models we have operated on will not work for a future planet that is livable and that is equitable. And unfortunately, I do not see the kind of massive change that Tesla brought about in the automobile industry in any other industry out there today. Companies continue to prize returning profit to shareholders above all other activities. I'm an advisor to some companies and I have seen public companies that have already the beginnings of solutions to the fundamental environmental and social problems that are at the core of their business, choosing to spend their profits on share buybacks and dividends instead of investing in bringing those solutions rapidly to scale. 91% of company profits today go either to dividends or share buybacks rather than being invested in innovation, in growth, in employee wages, and in the steps we need to take to create a sustainable world. You know, as I have taught this course on purpose and profit at Harvard Business School, written many cases studying closely the behavior of companies that shift to shared value. I've come to see that embracing shared value is a choice. And frankly, it's a very personal choice. There are many ways to make a living in the world, many ways to be successful. And there's no question, one can make a lot of money doing things that are harmful to stakeholders, that are unfair to customers, that extract labor at non-livable wages from employees, that destroy the planet. But shared value and everything else we've learned over the last decade and more shows us that there are equally good or better ways to make money in ways that reward employees, giving them economic opportunity and sustainable livelihoods, in ways that innovate to solve the immense environmental problems that we are facing as a planet today in ways that promote racial equity and the advancement of marginalized populations. There is simply no question anymore that we have a choice about how we want to pursue our careers, lead our companies, and provide for ourselves and our families. We can do it in a way that is fundamentally extractive and destructive of the world around us. Or we can do it in a way that creates shared value. As I talk with my students, I've come to see that it takes real courage, even today, 
to commit to a shared value approach in how one goes about one's career. It still is not the norm. But the reward of committing to a shared value approach is a more meaningful and satisfying life. Viktor Frankl is quoted as saying that man's search for meaning is the most powerful motivator in life. I've come to believe that that is true. But we have to find that meaning in our work. And the way to find that meaning in our work is to focus on creating shared value. I always have students who come to me and they say, you know, we're not going to be the CEO when we graduate, even from Harvard Business School, at least not right away. So how do we become shared value advocates in middle management? in other roles within a company. And I've given some advice and suggestions and to be sure, whatever your job, whatever your role, there are ways to increase the shared value that your company creates. But I've also come to see that it depends fundamentally on the leadership of company CEOs. And that if the CEOs and the boards and the shareholders do not endorse the idea of a positive social purpose at the root of corporate strategy, it doesn't happen. It takes real courage to make it happen. And so I say to my students today, you've got to go work for a company where the CEO gets it. You've got to find a company, whether it is one of these new disruptors that are born with shared value, whether it is an older company that needs to transition to more explicit shared value, or whether it is one of the dinosaurs like the fossil fuel companies that need to fundamentally transform, you need to go to a company where the leadership gets it and is sincerely committed to making this change because otherwise it just won't happen. So I'm asking each of you today, each of you who is out there in Zoom land listening to this, these remarks, to think about your own company and your own role there. Are you in a place where you can create shared value, where you can be part of this positive move and accelerate it in the way it needs to be accelerated for us to achieve sustainability? Or are you in a company that does not have that commitment? And if you are in a company that does not have that commitment, can you move the company forward fast enough and strongly enough? And if not, is this the right place for you to be? The time we have left to save our planet, to overcome the deep economic injustices is very short. Each of us needs to commit to do our part. We need to honestly look at what we are doing every day in our jobs and decide if we are making the progress that needs to be made fast enough, strongly enough. And if not, we cannot shirk our responsibility. We need to figure out how to make it happen at the company we're at, or perhaps at some other company. I know this is a profound challenge I am putting in front of you to think about how your career and how your daily effort at your job is accelerating a move toward shared value. But I believe that is the choice each of us faces. And I believe that the Shared Value Initiative has helped many people figure out how to make that move within their companies or between companies. It has been a powerful way for corporate leaders all over the world to learn from each other 
how to move more aggressively and more rapidly into shared value. And for that, I am very grateful for the efforts of the Shared Value Initiative and our affiliates around the world. But the ultimate answer is up to each of us. How will we shift what we do to bring about the changes that we know need to happen? And how will we make them happen fast enough? That is the message I want to leave you with today. So for all the good news, and there is a great deal of good news about how the world is moving towards shared value, the fact is, without your help, we will not move as rapidly and as strongly as we need to. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you for participating in this conference. We have many wonderful sessions coming up. And thank you for all that you have already done to move towards shared value and what you will do, I hope, going forward to move us even more rapidly toward that ultimate goal. Thank you for letting me be with you today, and I wish you a good day.